Good morning to everybody joining from the United States and, and good afternoon to everybody tuning in from out in the Arab Emirates. Uh, people are filing in from the lobby. Uh, if I can ask everybody here at the onset of today's session to please mute your systems. We will um, look to have a question and answer period later in the program, um, but for the moment, if we can ask everybody to please mute themselves. Again, uh, hello and welcome to everyone joining today. My name is Steve Lutz. I'm Vice President for Middle East Affairs at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I wanna recognize my colleague, Sarah Carley, a Director of the USUA Business Program at the Chamber. And I wanna also acknowledge and say a, a, a kudos and appreciation to our partners in the UAE, both MCHAM Abu Dhabi and MCHAM Dubai for their support of today's session and our ongoing work. And a special thanks to the team at Fleshman Hilliard for making today's webinar possible. The US Chamber is the world's largest business advocacy organization, representing the interest of over 3 million American companies of all sizes and sectors. Uh, we're proud to be the voice of the private sector in the United States and to work closely with our dynamic and innovative businesses to really grow and deepen our trade and investment ties around the globe and that certainly includes a focus on the UAE. And on behalf of the Chamber and our USUA Business Program, we're really delighted to be hosting today's session and hosting Her Excellency, Sarah Alamiri, the UAE's Minister of State for Advanced Technology and the Chairwoman of the UAE Space Agency for an overview of the projects of the 50. And she'll be joined today by two leaders who will share their company's perspectives on this bold new initiative, as well as their history and their aspirations in the UAE. Today's session, I do want to note, builds on the Chamber's webinar series, Economy 4.0, Innovative Transformation in the UAE, which has been done in partnership with our friends at the UAE Embassy here in Washington, DC. And that Economy 4.0 series has been showcasing cutting edge technologies that are transforming the UAE's economy and highlighting areas for new collaborations and partnerships, investment and vital policy dialogues, all of which we hope will drive uh, the already flourishing bilateral economic relationship to new heights. So far in this series, we focused on uh, clean energy and sustainability and the UAE's drive to be a leader in addressing the challenge of climate change, the growing digital asset ecosystems in the UAE and work around developing a favorable regulatory environment to position the UAE as a global leader in that rapidly developing sector. And also we've touched on genomics and personalized medicine in the UAE's designs to create a genomic blueprint for UAE nationals that will allow healthcare professionals to provide more tailored preventative care and better address chronic diseases. And our Economy 4.0 series will culminate with the chamber and the embassy coming together to host an innovation and investment summit later this year. So please stay tuned. Your Excellency, I do want to applaud the UAE for your focus on innovation and risk-taking and entrepreneurism, be that in digital transformation or the energy transition, the space exploration uh, or public health. There's really a boldness in thought and in aspiration uh, while you're also keeping an eye toward an inclusive and sustainable post-COVID recovery. So Your Excellency, we really do look forward to hearing from you today about this new exciting initiative, the projects of the 50, and do let me allow to uh, allow me a moment to introduce you uh, in your role as Minister of State for Advanced Technologies. <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> Her Excellency spearheads the UAE Ministry of Industry and Advanced Technologies efforts to empower the adoption of the fourth industrial revolution technologies and promote research and development in advanced science and technology to create new industries that will drive the shift towards a knowledge based economy. This in turn contributes to the overall mandate of the ministry to strengthen the UAE's industrial base, ensure in-country value, and raise the competitiveness of local industries. Her Excellency is also, of course, the chair of the UAE Space Agency, and in that capacity is responsible for overseeing the agency's mandate of pioneering the space sector, ensuring its contribution to the national economy and to the UAE's sustainable development. She's also in a leadership role in so many other different capacities that um, are almost too numerous to, to maintain. But I do wanna add that 
2015, the World Economic Forum uh, honored Her Excellency as one of its 50 young scientists for her contributions to science, technology, and engineering. Uh, your Excellency, you've already distinguished yourself uh, so much already in your career. Uh, we thank you for what's uh, being done in the UAE and for joining us today at the U.S. Chamber. We look forward to your remarks on the project of the 50 and what that means for the future of the UAE. And then following your remarks, we'll hear from our two private sector leaders. So Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve, and a very good morning to everyone joining us today. Um, it, to start off with the projects of the 50, um, it's a culmination of uh, the work that the country has gone through uh, throughout the last 50 years. This year, we uh, celebrate our golden jubilee as a nation um, and reflect on the fact that 50 years ago, uh, we didn't have basic road networks, education system, currency, um, nor basic access to healthcare. Um, and as we move forward, uh, the main discussion point with regards to shaping and the main principles to shaping um, our advent into the next 50 years of this nation has been on developing capabilities and capacity, ensuring that, that our industries are quite agile and robust, and therefore comes the, the adoption of technology arm that is spearheaded through the Ministry of Industry and Advanced Technology. Amongst the projects of the 50, we have launched a full program to adopt uh, technology across existing industries. The aim of that is to increase their competitiveness globally and to increase partnerships um, across the globe. And that's where that's one venue of partnership and collaboration that we've seen multinationals including those that are based out of the United States, be part of our Champions Network, uh, which works together with SMEs um, within the country to be able to create the right value for investing in technology and adopting that across manufacturing processes and also development processes. Uh, we are working very closely with several companies uh, to find the right mechanism by which they can take on technologies that will add on to their uh, design and development capabilities and add on to their pr production capacity and allow them to be more competitive and produce more competitive products and services. Um, and that has been focused on several uh, areas that are of importance, uh, including the chemicals industry, uh, plastics and rubbers. Uh, we've also looked at the steel um, and, and metal and aluminum uh, manufacturing facilities within the country including uh, also consumer uh, products, be it from food and beverage um, industry. We continue uh, to look at mechanisms to select the right technologies to invest in and the right technologies to invest in for, for each sector. Uh, and that's an advent by which uh, companies are more and more eager to, to uh, adopt technology and be able to uh, move forward their businesses. Uh, we also have incentive packages uh, both from access to a uh, five million five billion dirham um, uh, fund through the Emirates Development Bank to adopt technology, and that's a mechanism by which we are spearheading that adoption. In addition to that, um, technological advancement and technological utilization across industry would not become the norm unless we have a solid base for research development following on to commercialization. Uh, so we're, for the first time, putting together a full uh, a research and development agenda that doesn't only look at blue sky research um, and uh, fundamental research, but looks at the entire spectrum, including dedicating funding and direction, directional funding for commercialization. So deployment, uh, so focusing on the development part of the research and development and ensuring that the deployment of technologies into uh, industry is followed through all the way to um, scaling it up and finding the right benefits from it. That's on the realm of industrial development and more importantly on, on technological advancements within, within, within current industry. When we look at future industries, a lot of them do have a large focus on science and technology, life sciences, healthcare, personalized medicine that you've mentioned, Steve, is very important uh, and hence why we've entered into the genome study and, and, and 
um, getting that set of data in uh, to be able to transform healthcare. We're also looking at biotechnology as one of the areas, and I will segue into space because space is actually an industry that we are investing um, in developing capabilities in, but more importantly, developing the space industry, so the private sector uh, deployment there. The programs that we have today in place within the space sector is about building capabilities and capacities in the, in the private sector and also fostering relationship between SMEs, both in the UAE and different countries around the world. Um, as you know, the Emirates Mars mission was, was one of the pivotal missions that we had that was meant to disrupt education, uh, research, trigger, trigger an innovation ecosystem within the Emirates. And more importantly, increase our national risk appetite, which you require for uh, working in any industry that has technology as one of its, you, as a utilizer of technology, adopter of technology or developer of technology. We also want to accelerate our capabilities in designing and developing complex systems, uh, deploying engineering and research, uh, and being able to do that through uh, one mission has been a, a phenomenal experience that we're now elevating it and deploying it across different industries. The Emirates Mars mission was about building capabilities capacity, changing our risk appetite, uh, moving forward as a nation in, in an area that is considered complex from a technological perspective. The upcoming mission to the asteroid belt is about taking that know-how and capabilities and deploying them into the creation of new SMEs. In the space sector, we have 50 plus um, SMEs today in existence. We want them to be at par uh, with, uh, with de designing and developing for the most complex part of the space, space continuum, and that's for exploration. Uh, with that, we are also putting together a fund to ensure that we are supporting uh, those businesses down the line to design and develop uh, engineering systems, to design and develop services and products that come out of space and ensure that there's a continuation through the different pro programs and projects. And as you know, the Emirates Mars mission was in partnership with the University of Colorado. Our upcoming mission is also continuation. It utilizes a lot of the design elements that we had on the Emirates Mars mission. And we move forward with that partnership again with the University of Colorado so that we're able to spin off companies from the team members that have been there. We've also seen leaders um, from, from um, industry and from the US industry setting up uh, operations within the Emirates. NanoRacks is one of them. Um, this week, we have the International Astronautical Congress where several uh, US-based uh, companies have been here uh, in Dubai discussing potential for expanding investments, but also more importantly, potential for integrating US businesses with UAE businesses across industry to ensure that the building, the partnership is actually uh, more organic and the partnership is more continuous and, and not only related towards policy creation or government procurement. Um, we continue to transform our work permit and um, our talent attraction mechanism as a country, ensuring that, that there is a long-term access to talent to the country to be able to co-create and to be able to co-develop across various different developments. The areas that we are focusing on, on in, in our economy from advanced manufacturing to play on ICT, to agritech, to FinTech, to health tech and medicine, all of these sectors thrive on diversity. And that's one of the aspects that the UAE has quite a lot of, and we want to continue to leverage that uh, as a country so that we're able uh, to leverage again on our strong points, both in, in healthcare and aerospace and space and supply chain and logistics, renewable energy and e-commerce are all up and coming industri industrial sectors within our economy that we're able to further leverage on. And as a nation, Building partnerships with the UAE allows, uh, uh, gives companies that are based in the country or have a form of an operation in the country an ability to capitalize on, ex on existing trade partnerships that we have with the region and future trade partnerships that the UAE has with the region. Our future partnerships focuses on the region, the Middle East, um, and also focuses on opening markets uh, across Asia and markets across uh, Africa. And that provides a, a good springboard uh, utilizing the UAE, not only to 
to feed into the market in the country, but also feed into markets across Asia um, and Africa and be able to continue doing business uh, with the region at large. Um, as we continue uh, with our economic partnerships, I'll name a few countries that uh, the economic partnerships are underway with, is with through India, Indonesia, Turkey, UK, Israel, Kenya, South Korea, and Ethiopia. And our goal is to have a 40 billion dirham or 10.9 billion US dollar annual uh, increase in trade with these markets. And a lot of the programs that, are, that, that, that the government is supporting um, and also businesses are supporting are focused on increasing trade with these markets. And therefore we provide a platform as a nation for businesses to use, uh, to capitalize on these trades uh, and these markets opening up to the country. In the, in the aspect of the fourth industrial revolution, our industry 4.0, uh, we are currently working on the support of development and growth of 500 new technology focused companies to drive an industrial revolution, including a tech drive that will inject about uh, 1.35 US dollar billion US dollars into advanced technology adoption in the private sector, where we have that champions network that I spoke about that is going to support that endeavor. We took this industry 4.0 um, advent not only as a strategic implication what we're doing is working together with 200 companies within the country a lot of them are SMEs to put together the roadmap of adopting technology the roadmap of investing in technology and the roadmap and requirements that they have as industrial players on academia to increase the research and development output in, in the areas that is uh, important for them. And we continue that leveraging on the business environment that we have here, the strategic location of the country, the strong financial um, reserves, and then the large sovereign wealth funds that are also supportive of scientific and technological advancements across key, uh, across key um, uh, industries. Uh, we continue to work together with both our free zones and also our economic zones to ensure that, that the businesses of focus and the industries of focus are um, are ones that we support through uh, policies and regulation in, in, to, to ensure that we are uh, beneficial to those. And on the front of regulations, we do have a regulatory sandbox uh, to, to support businesses to test technologies. And we are expanding that into having physical sandboxes to allow for specific technologies to be te tested, demonstrated uh, for companies around the world to leverage on the particular arid environment that we have there here. And it's very important, for example, for Agritech uh, to utilize a different environment than what exists in the world today to be able to test those technologies for the region at large. Um, as the world has come together, uh, and just to conclude, uh, through Expo 2020, we have more than 192 countries participating. We've seen various uh, perspectives come to play in a small microcosm within Expo 2020. And the microcosm that of Expo 2020 is actually reflective to uh, the multicultural and multi-religious and multi-background population that makes up the Emirates from uh, of 195 nationalities coexisting in one place, having different skills and, and backgrounds, bringing them together um, across complex set of, uh, of challenges and problems to be able to uh, facilitate the advancement uh, and moving forward as a, as, as a nation um, that understands its role as a global citizen, considering that we have global citizens within our nation. Um, with that, I thank everyone for, for joining us today, and I'm happy to um, answer questions after we hear from both Rada and Norman. Well, Your Excellency, thank you so much. I mean, that was incredibly comprehensive. And as I mentioned, I think it's a, an incredibly bold and, and aspirational uh, agenda that you have set forth. And not only have you, you put an agenda on the table, but you're, you're operationalizing it, you're moving forward, you know, seeking tangible results, you know, to your credit. So uh, very exciting. And I think we all watch with pride, you know, because there was such an, uh, you know, American involvement in, in the, the Emirates uh, Mars mission. So uh, major congrats on that. And we look forward, you know, to the forthcoming uh, endeavors in that. Um, very exciting. Before we turn to our private sector panel, um, I did want to ask you, a question and in the, in the space agency comes to mind. Um, can you speak to the effort that the UAE is putting in in growing your human talent, investing in in your own people? Um, because that seems to be part of the secret sauce of the success 
um, but would love to hear your thoughts on that. All of our programs, especially in the space sector, has been about building capabilities and capacity. So you see a lot of our partnerships are not traditional partnerships, but more partnerships where our teams work together to build experience in areas that we don't have in the country. That's the only way that you're able to establish a sector that doesn't exist in any nation is by building experience and expertise. The way we've done it in the space sector across the last uh, decade has been about designing and developing complex systems that are being designed for the very first time for both ourselves and also our partner institutions and having our team work very closely with uh, team members for that are very well experienced, some of them over five decades of experience um, in the area that they're working on. That's significant knowledge to put into uh, building expertise and capabilities in the country. Um, and that's one of the ingredients of establishing any new sector in any country. Um, and uh, being able to do it in a short amount of time is by picking a very challenging and risky program or project. We continue to do that as uh, within the space agency today. One of our fundamental objectives is building capability and capacity in the private sector. So we want to do the same thing that was that that happened with the different programs in supporting um, UAE nationals and building capabilities to supporting companies, regardless of nationalities, companies that are based in the UAE, to build their capability and capacity. So we're giving them an opportunity to have a role in the planetary exploration mission. So, for example, if somebody is building parts of a uh, parts of a uh, power system uh, that is required for spacecrafts, we allow them to work as part of our team. Uh, to build on their capabilities, to deliver on a very complex system for space exploration that is very serious, especially with the mission that we're going on, uh, with which they are then able to design and develop those uh, components for where the business is. So for Earth observation satellites or for uh, satellites which go into um, uh, which go into low Earth orbit, uh, and that gives them an additional niche and a benefit. We did that on the Emirates Mars mission where we had a, a company that manufactures uh, parts for um, aircrafts um, out of Abu Dhabi to manufacture parts for our spacecraft, that's TPI. Um, we have parts on the Emirates Mars mission, which is on the Hope probe, which is currently around orbit in Mars that has parts that are made in the UAE. Uh, that was not possible before. We worked with that company to elevate the standard to space grade for it to be to pass the tests that we have there there was no undercutting on tests but to pass the tests that we have so they're able to produce at space grade and we can we will continue doing that program that's now one of the programs that will sit on our new asteroid belt mission and we we will have a fund that will be announced early next year by the space agency for supporting companies to bridge the gap in capabilities and capacity that they require to be able to produce for that. Now, how do we take this lesson learned? So this is the lesson learned from the space sector. We will continue that. We will also utilize this lesson learned across the other industries that I spoke about that requires technology and in, in, in intensive uh, capabilities. Uh, and there will be an element of building cap capability and capacity there. Really fascinating. And I, I think it's a, a major part of the success story has been the homegrown talent and, and really utilizing and, and drawing upon that and investing in that. And, and, and really, I have to give a, a major shout out to the UAE for the, the open door policy you've had. You've mentioned the regulatory sandboxes, um, the, the integration and discussion with the private sector on that policy regulatory environment has been very critical and I think very well received. One other question before we turn to our, our private sector panelists, you, you mentioned some of the, the, the priority markets, you know, that you're looking at, um, you know, here in the United States, there was, of course, a lot of buzz around the Abraham Accords, and would welcome your thoughts. Uh, and we've seen, I think, some of the success of that, how that is actually coming into operation. And, and are you seeing fruits of, of that agreement come forward in, in the economic space? Yes, through the Abraham Accords, I think both of our, of the countries made a decision that they correct mechanism for us to move forward is to ensure that our businesses are linked together and our businesses are introduced together. They largely, we largely operated as two countries that didn't have much relations with each other prior to the Abraham uh, Accords. Uh, today, the way that we are working is putting companies together. So we've done a lot of introductory um, introductions, both by, by ourselves at the ministry and our counterpart ministries uh, in Israel to ensure that businesses 
have the potential to work together, facilitated projects and programs uh, between them, um, and continue to do so on the realm of technology at large uh, and industry um, with specific industries that we're focusing on. In the area of the space sector, we also have signed a letter, signed a letter of intent as two government entities, but it, the intention was actually for private businesses to talk to each other. They're actually, they're, they're doing that today um, by either sending proposals to existing programs across the two countries or hosting payloads on, on spacecrafts that are going from, from one country or the other. Um, and that's the type of, that takes longer to facilitate uh, but it, that's the type of relationships that we are building because those are the most sustained uh, relationship, regardless of uh, government to government relations, business to business relations will continue and foster when there is an opportunity. It's creating the opportunities there. On the research realm, also, it's very important for us to continue advancing on the research realm. So you have the continuous influx of knowledge into industry. Uh, we've linked together, again, researchers on in both countries in specific areas that are of priority. We've done several uh, workshops together so that researchers understand what are the areas of research across the two countries and where are the potential of uh, working together on them. Very interesting and, and appreciate your insights on that. And it's it's always encouraging to hear that things are, are moving forward and uh, something that was uh, signed on paper is actually being put into practice. So appreciate that, Your Excellency. And we invite you to stay around and hear from our from our two private sector experts. I'm going to introduce them, then uh, turn to them with a question. Uh, first, we have uh, Norm Gilsdorf, uh, Vice President of Honeywell Growth, uh, Global High Growth Regions and President of ASEAN, Russia, and Customs Union. Uh, in this capacity, Norm is responsible for delivering industry solutions from Honeywell to regions that include aerospace products and services, control technologies for buildings and industry and performance materials. Uh, prior to this current role, uh, Norm, Norm served as the global president for Honeywell Process Solutions, a pioneer in automation control, software solutions, instrumentation and services for industrial process manufacturers. And before that, he served as the senior vice president and general manager for process licensing with Honeywell UO, UOP. And he began his career in 1977 at UOP, which is now fully owned by Honeywell. And I do wanna mention he received a degree in chemical engineering from Purdue University and in 2011 was inducted to the Purdue Co-op Hall of Fame. And Norm, I say that as a, as a graduate of Indiana University, uh, the Purdue's big rival. Um, so I had to get Purdue worked in. Uh, Norm has been a real leader with the US Chamber and worked with us in a number of key markets across the region. And we truly value his leadership and commitment. Um, also joining the panel, we're very excited. You talk about incredible homegrown talent there in the UAE. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by Rola Abdumana, the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank UAE, a role she's held since 2018, a trailblazer in this field. She's the first Emirati woman to head a bank in the United Arab Emirates. And in this role, Rola has been responsible for transforming the UAE business into one of the five biggest markets for the Standard Chartered Bank. Over the years, Rola has been a champion for women empowerment and female entrepreneurship through a number of initiatives and is fully committed to supporting the wider community by providing university students with mentorship programs to better prepare the participants with the skills they'll need to succeed in their professions. As a testament to all of her good work and efforts, Rola was featured as one of the Middle East 100 Power Businesswomen by Forbes Middle East in 2020 as well as other honorifics by the Arabian Business and Financial News. Before joining Standard Chartered Bank, she was head of corporate and investment banking for Abu Dhabi at First Abu Dhabi National First Abu Dhabi Bank, a responsible for relationships between bank, the bank and its private and institutional customers. And she also served as the general manager of FAB's wholesale banking group. She completed her studies at the University of London and earned a bachelor's degree in science and operational research. So Norm, Rola, we're really delighted to have you both uh, with us today. And we really appreciate uh, both of your companies, a strong support uh, and act active participation with the chamber, not only in the UAE, uh, but across the Middle East region. And I wanna ask uh, both of you, if you could share with us briefly about your company's uh, presence in the UAE 
and why this initiative, the Project of the 50, is important from your perspective and how it really ties into the aspirations that your company has uh, going forward in the UAE. And Norm, I'm going to come to you first on that and roll up, then we'll uh, turn to you. Norm, thanks for being well, here. Thank well, thank you, Steve. Thanks for uh, inviting me to today's uh, important discussion. Uh, and thank you to Her Excellency for the detailed description of this new and important initiative. Um, it's almost become a cliche to say that the UAE is a country on a mission. Um, while most countries react to events um, as they unfold, the UAE, I can see, is actively shaping its future and determining its own destiny. And I, I think a lot of what Her Excellency described is about setting that destiny. And I think that is what the Projects 50 is all about, shaping the future to enhance the UAE's position as a global hub for creativity and commerce. And at Honeywell, one of our sayings is the future is what we make it. So this ambitious vision is one that resonates well to us as a company. And at the heart of the Projects 50, of course, is the ongoing phenomena of digital transformation as highlighted by Her Excellency. Honeywell's made a sizable investment in the UAE. We have over a thousand employees and have research and production centers two technology and innovation centers, and an industrial cybersecurity excellence center. So digital transformation is also at the core of what we're trying to do with our partner companies, with our customers, and it's a big part of the Projects 50 initiative. In fact, two of the projects in the 50 initiatives are projects that are vitally important to Honeywell and as highlighted by Her Excellency, Industry 4.0. And that's um, both the industry 4.0, but the data protection regulation. And uh, as industry 4.0 unlocks the power of AI, machine learning and drives improved efficiencies and productivities, whether it be for the small startups, the SMEs or the other industrial companies looking to make a home in the UAE, the lifeblood will be data. And as data feeds algorithms, it feeds artificial intelligence, and then that's all driven off the ability to assemble data in cloud computing and be able to then leverage that data. And what the UAE has done and, and the help of the chamber is worked on data regulations, and particularly of late, I've been very impressed as those regulations have been developed, which will create an environment that will encourage the UAE to be a center for both cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and industry 4.0. And we're pleased with the ministry, minister's um, leadership and focus on Industry 4.0. And we're proud to be one of the first champions of the 4.0 champions that was signed last week. And we look forward to be working with industries across the region to help teach and train and coach them on what Industry 4.0 means. And then lastly, another aspect of projects of the 50 is its alignment with the UAE's net zero by 2050 strategic initiative that was just recently announced. Honeywell's also made a pledge of being carbon neutral and by 2035, and we're heavily investing in several exciting new sustainability technologies, some of which are being developed right here in the UAE at Mazdar City, our, where we have a pioneering center for sustainability and a hub for research and development. So for us, we're very strongly aligned with this uh, 50 initiative program and all the components of it. We look forward to working with the ministry and the UAE government and you in the, uh, the, the, the uh, chamber there to drive this forward. Thank you. Well, Norm, thank you very much. And I have to say, <laughs> It's really great to see what, what Honeywell's doing or has done, but more importantly, what you uh, want to do going forward. And I love the way you put it that you is pro. Company's perspective, you know, why is this initiative important? And, and we'd love to hear a little bit about what Standard Chartered's been doing over the years in the UAE, but more importantly, yeah, what does the future look like? Where do you want to go to? 
So with that, Rola, turning to you, and thank you so much for being with us today as well. Thank you very much, Steve, for having me. And it was a pleasure hearing Her Excellency, the Minister, give an insight on the project of the 50. And it's also a pleasure to be with Norman as one of the panelists. Um, so Standard Chartered definitely welcomes and supports the UAE strategic uh, focus on technology, in particular, the project of the 50 as building the enabling conditions of the development of an efficient, highly advanced technology focused society that is forging ahead regional and regionally and competing globally. Now, as a bank, we have been in the UAE since the 50s, and our main objective is to offer outstanding value to our clients. But our brand of promise, uh, our brand promise of here for good as well, build on it. And we do that by aiming to be the world's most sustainable and responsible bank. We always to align with the vision of the UAE to be the best in the region and forge a way ahead globally. And as a bank, we are aligned with the project of the 50, and we are a major support, supporter of attracting top talents in the region and, and in the UAE, as well as Emirati talent. And this is done by committing to promoting Emirati talent and top talent, and having made, we've made magnificent steps in ensuring we're meeting these key milestones. Um, we are also continuing to invest in technology. We're working with various UAE entities on key initiatives, including open banking and digital currencies. Our banking systems utilize the best in class technology, and we ensure that our technology is shared with our UAE clients, which in turn drive efficiency. At the same time, we would like we welcome and congratulate the UAE on its net zero announcement. And in that regard, can add that technology will play a key role in helping to deliver that net zero commitment. We, as a bank, we've also made a pledge by 2030, uh, Standard Chartered will achieve net zero. We work very closely with our clients uh, on achieving uh, their net zero as well. Working with the supply chain, we've launched a number of initiatives on certain products uh, with certain clients in the UAE, whether it was in the debt capital market or in the trade finance, or as well on the wealth management offering a sustainable finance product. And if we look at Invest UAE, the UAE's role as a key bridge between China, India, and Africa will only grow bigger and we're best positioned as a bank to also support and work on the expansion with our specific emerging markets focus. Well, Rola, thank you. you. You covered so much ground and there was a lot of interesting things that we would we could probably spend hours on in, in their own right just talking about, but it's wonderful to hear the alignment that, that the bank has, I think, strategically taken with the projects of the 50 and many of the objectives that the UAE's outlined um, you know, in the knowledge-based economy, and particularly in the areas of, you know, sustainability, uh, and, all, and this area in sustainable finance, which we, hopefully we have time, and I want to come back to that. Um, but Norma, coming back to you, I wonder if, if you could share with us about Honey, Honeywell's role um, as a sponsor of the USA Pavilion at Expo. I know Her Excellency mentioned uh, the, the Expo, which has been underway now for over a month, and if you could talk about that in the technology uh, that you're showcasing uh, there at the, how that syncs with the UAE's economic future. Well, thanks, Steve. And yes, Honeywell's very proud to be one of the key uh, U.S. company sponsors of the U.S. Pavilion at the Dubai Expo, which of course, as you mentioned, opened last month. Um, the theme of the U.S. Pavilion is life, liberty, and the pursuit of the future ideas that resonate well, both in the US and the UAE, I think for all of us. Um, and the pavilion showcases a lot of great ideas and technology in which the US has played a major impact over, over time and currently playing a major impact. And we at Honeywell are proud to be highlighting our quantum computing technology. Um, and it was selected to be part of one of the exhibits this is uh, an enabling technology which will really help us all create that future. 
in that it can solve extremely complex problems very, very quickly. And, and it's real today. It's, it's not just talk, it, it's a reality and, and we, we showcase it. So we're really looking forward to people visiting and seeing that. So the whole expo is really fantastic. I've been there myself. I've got to go back many more times to see it all. And uh, I hope you all have an opportunity to visit. Thanks. Thank you for those insights, Norman. I think uh, it's, it's a good call to action for all to, uh, to come and, and check out the expo. I know we look forward to getting to the UAE and definitely paying it a visit. Um, Rola, coming back to you with a, a good follow-up question. Uh, Standard Chartered Bank has shown really considerable foresight and invested significant resources in your women in tech program, where you have clear alignments with Her Excellency's portfolio, as well as the projects of the 50. Would love to have you share your insights on this tremendous program and, and tell us more about it. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I'm extremely proud of our Women in Tech program. And this program is aimed really at supporting female-led businesses, which is driven by technology and innovation. And now our aim is to create more opportunities for women to develop entrepreneurial and leading uh, expert, leadership expertise. So the Standard Chartered Women in Tech program is dedicated to empowering UAE-based female-led businesses. And the objective is to provide guidance, mentorship to female-led businesses, enabled by technology and innovation across the UAE. Now, it is based on a number of things. Enhancing the expertise of female entrepreneurs through training and workshops, accelerating the growth and success of female-led startups, fostering the exchange of knowledge and expertise, identifying and addressing the challenges that female founders and their businesses face uh, as they are building their startup to ensure that a robust, robust and advanced infrastructure is put in place. At the same time, it is important for them to establish a global network that is built on the strength of partnership for the benefit of uh, these uh, female-led startups. And at this, at, it's important to facilitate learning around global project organization, network building, and investment ready, readiness. Um, now, this program, we have it in nine markets globally uh, across the standard charted, and seven of these markets are in our region, and that's why the UAE is one of these markets. We've already accelerated two cohorts, uh, which includes 12 startups. Uh, we, uh, and who have collectively raised over $5 million from various venture capitalists uh, that expand on their businesses in and out of the UAE. Uh, we've worked closely uh, with DIFC Fintech Hive uh, as our accelerator partner, as well as Hub71 as our ecosystem partner. And this year we've launched with them uh, the third uh, cycle for Women in Tech Accelerator. So we're very uh, positive about this program because that's how at the end of the day, you'll be able to build more female uh, entrepreneurs in the world of FinTech. Rola, thank you so much. It's really amazing to hear about this program and I'm sure it's going to reap positive impacts for generations to come. But somebody has to step forward and, and make the effort. So congratulations to you and Sandra Charter for that. Uh, such an amazing program. At this point, what we'd like to do, I have other questions that I could ask uh, Her Excellency or our two panels, but we do want to give an opportunity and, and open it up. I know we've got a, a number of our uh, chamber member companies and other guests joining us today uh, on this webinar. And I would ask people if you can either to use the raise your hand function or come off mute and I will call on you and ask you to uh, give us your name and affiliation. Um, so with that, do we, do we have any questions or comments from the floor uh, from our participants? We'll give a moment here to see if we have any hands go up. I think uh, between uh, Her Excellency and our two panels, they covered so much ground. Uh, let's see, uh, do, we, do we have any questions or comments? Well, while we're waiting for that, Your Excellency, if I can come back to you Wanted to get your thoughts. Both um, Norm and Rola mentioned, you know, their their companies net zero commitments. 
Um, obviously, we're about ready to go into COP26. Announcements are being made. Um, would love to hear your uh, thoughts on that, that intersection of advanced technology, many of the things in your portfolio, and the tackling the, the challenge of climate change and, and climate adaptation and mitigation strategies. Where, where you see that and in, in how the UAE is really uh, not just a global leader, but a or not just a regional leader, but really taking on global leadership on this and would welcome, and I know this isn't your ministry particularly, but obviously there's a lot of overlap in the, the, the things that you're brewing or that you're working on there in the ministry obviously have implications for tackling this challenge. So would welcome to hear your thoughts on this. Absolutely. The net zero declaration that the Emirates worked on is it was not owned by a single ministry. It was actually owned across all sectors because the contribution needs to be across the board. When it comes to industry, one of the largest plays that we have is research and development and utilizing of technology uh, to reach to um, net zero uh, contribution. And uh, what we've looked at is putting together the right policies, the right research di directions that needs to be invested in, especially for industries uh, that exist today. So we're able to meet uh, that objective uh, that we've declared. Um, and that's under, undergoing underway uh, with both of the policy realm um, and also with regards to um, including more industries that are tech consensus, but don't have a lot of um, uh, footprint when it comes to their carbon emissions. Excellent. And you know, you're, you're spot on. It, it is a all hands on deck challenge. Uh, so it can't be any one ministry or it can't be just the government. It's a government and private sector citizens. We all have a piece of this and more responsibilities, you know, to be successful. Um, I, I, I see a hand up and I wanted to turn to uh, Fatima with Abu Dhabi Islamic Bank. If I can, Fatima, please, uh, with your comments or question. Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, an excellent presentation. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you, Rola. Thank you, Norman. And of course, thank you, Steve. Um, my question is, how important is innovation in the line of work of each of our panelists? Thank you very much. Well, let me let me throw that. We'll go first to our, our two panelists. Uh, innovation in your companies. How important is that? And then, uh, Your Excellency, we'll come back to you with your thoughts on that. But uh, Rola, I see you're unmuted. And then Norm. Thank you, um, Fatma. I think uh, this is uh, something that I would say we saw more in COVID. Uh, innovation is uh, key. Uh, for us, especially if I talk about the banking sector. And when we say innovation, obviously we also refer to digitization. And that's how uh, we also, what brings innovation is having a, a diversified and inclusive workforce, uh, because this is where you would see more ideas come in. And this is why we're, we see a country like the UAE with lots of talent and focusing on talent and lots of ideas coming out. So if I look at banking, uh, innovation for us is how to make sure that at the end of the day, we have very smooth and very fast uh, one-stop shop in terms of operation. What clients want? They want to be able to do all their banking on their mobile app. And whether it's their investments in managing their wealth management, doing their mortgages, if we're talking about the retail, um, or, or just assessing how much uh, they are in terms of their spending. And this is obviously what we're looking at when we build digital and virtual also banks. And if we look at the corporate sector, and this is what COVID has co uh, taught us, is when we went into a lockdown, how we were able to continue to serve our clients. And, and as a bank, we made sure that their operation is not interrupted. And that's how we were, companies that were on our platform in terms of managing their uh, transactional banking were able to make sure that their operations went smoothly, payments were not interrupted, letters of guarantees of credit, all of this was honored. And, and the companies that were have had some doubts about the, uh, having their banking platform uh, digitally immediately saw the difference. And that's why now we see more and more companies making sure that they want to have that uh, digital platform within their operation. And we as a bank has been, have been investing heavily 
uh, uh, in our digital uh, capabilities to better serve our clients. And uh, what COVID has uh, done is really, it has just fast-tracked the digital agenda. Very interesting, Rola. Norm, I want to come to you with that same perspective on innovation and in your excellency. We actually have a question in the chat that I'm going to uh, pose to you. So, Norm, your perspective on the innovation. Well, innovation is at the core of, of everything at Honeywell. I mean, we're over 100 years old and everything we've done in all of our sectors is built upon breakthrough innovation, whether it be in aerospace, you know, whether it be avionics or moon missions or the like, whether it be in our buildings, whether it be in oil and gas or warehousing or refrigerants. I mean, innovation every, every day, that's what we wake up thinking about. I would like to take upon two points Rola mentioned that I think are very key. Inclusion and diversity. To continue innovating, inclusion and diversity is critical because the diversity of thought, the inclusion of new ideas from wherever it is in the world of the company, from whoever it comes from, is critical for success. And I want to highlight that that needs even more emphasis going forward. And then third, briefly about COVID. I think COVID actually within our company accelerated innovation. Um, we did things during COVID that we could have never imagined. One example is, you know, within 30 days from request, we built a mass factory in the UAE in LA. You know, normally that would have taken a year or two. We did it in 30 days. We invented a healthy building solution. We invented a solution to go in and out of aircraft to completely uh, clean them while downtime. And just multiple solutions came because people started collaborating and thinking differently. So innovation is at the core. Inclusion and diversity is critical. Innovation is going to have to speed up to meet the challenges that Her Excellency and Rola both brought up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your insights on that. And I would say I think innovation is so core to the future of our bilateral um, economic endeavors. So it's it's an exciting time. And, and your two companies are certainly uh, right in the mix on all of that. Your Excellency, I'm coming to you with a question, and this I think will have to be our, our last one, specifically to your responsibilities as chair of the UA Space Agency. So the question is, how will the UA Space Agency and the Mohammed Rashid Space Center cooperate or compete with the um, uh, with each uh, other on future projects? And specifically, what role do you see the UAE wanting to play in the lunar exploration? Um, so first to start off, cooperate is, is probably the right term, considering we're both uh, government entities that have uh, different complementary mandates with regards to the wider space sector. Uh, in terms of lunar exploration, it fits in with uh, both uh, um, are an existing program that is uh, in the works. Uh, it's one of the minor programs that we have in terms of lunar exploration. Uh, there is uh, a look, we were signatories on the Artemis Accords. We are looking at the potential of uh, uh, working on manned uh, missions uh, that have an element towards increasing the humanity's access to uh, exploration if it's the moon or beyond uh, the moon. So those are ongoing discussions today across the two organizations and also internationally in what role the UAE will play. Well, thank you for addressing that. And your Excellency, I wanted to come back to you. We'll, we'll, we're, we do our best to try to keep ourselves on time. For any, any, any final parting thoughts you have, and I always like to ask if you had kind of one overarching message that you would like to share with American companies, um, perhaps that aren't, that aren't as familiar with the UAE like Honeywell or Standard Charter, what would that message, what would that big takeaway be? There's a vast realm for cooperation, especially if we're talking about science and technology within the country, uh, space is only one of them. Um, and the environment continues to evolve as, an, as a governance mechanism here in the Emirates, it's becoming more and more agile. Um, and we not only seek opportunities, but react to opportunities and tackle challenges as potential opportunities. We've done that very well in the COVID um, experience. We've even changed the way we govern as a country. Um, and that will continue being the, the, the modus operandi for the, for the country in the years to come. 
Well, Your Excellency, thank you so very much. And I want to also thank two panelists, Norm and Rolla, for thanking time out of your days, uh, but even more importantly, for your commitment to this bilateral relationship and, and all that you're doing. And I would just offer that whether it's uh, around topics like digital transformation or the energy transition and, and all of the ancillary opportunities around uh, the climate change and that, or whether it's public health infrastructure or many of the other things like space uh, that Her Excellency's talked about. Um, at the US Chamber, we very much look forward to continuing to bring together government officials and business leaders uh, to think creatively um, about what that future can look like, and then actually to tangibly, hopefully see some of the fruits of those discussions. And Your Excellency, we very much appreciate your leadership and really the leadership of the UAE in ensuring that there is an open dialogue with the private sector on that policy regulatory environment, uh, because we know that 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 has a, a goes a long way, you know, to attracting that type of FDI and that that creative kind of dynamic type of investment uh, that really is, I think, at the at the foundation of what is a really already flourishing but an incredible relationship with much more potential going forward. So we thank you and we hope to see you in, in Washington or here in the United States uh, on, a, on, a future, on a future trip. And to, to Norm and Rolla, again, thank you and, and your teams and to all of the companies who have joined today. We're very grateful for your time uh, being with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And, and with that, we will uh, conclude today's session and wish everybody well. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.